Well, thank you for that nice introduction, and thank you, Powells, and you all for being here. Um, normally, I have a, a more formal presentation. I have a have a video that I've I've shown at readings, but tonight's a special night, so I'm going to to do something a little different, and I'm going to tell stories a little bit more, and of course, I'm going to do some reading as well. But it's special because one, this is where it Powell's. We're in Oregon. Astoria is very nearby, the, the, the center of the story. Um, and also, um, we're, we're here with uh, C-SPAN, Book TV. And so we have a national audience as well as a, a or Oregon audience. So um, I'm going to tell some stories. And, and you Oregonians may know some of the stories, and you may not know others. But um, I'll start with how I came to this story. And actually, what's surprising about it is how this story is, was very well known in its day. In 1836, when Washington Irving was commissioned by John Jacob Astor to write the story of these events 20 years after they occurred, Irving's book, also called Astoria, was a bestseller of 1836. And those events have been largely forgotten in the American consciousness. Uh, I think you in Oregon know a little bit more about them, or I'm sure some of you know a lot more about them. But in the national consciousness, they're, they're largely forgotten, and, uh, except among historians and people who really follow Western history. Um, so, it is a really important story. It's historically significant, and it's a great adventure story. And that's partly what attracted me to it. And it's also a story that I feel needs to be told um, because it's, it's had a, uh, those events have had a big impact on the shape of the North American continent and on the, um, the course of American empire, the, these events that happened in, over these three years from 1810 to 1813. So I stumbled across this story just kind of randomly. And there are many things about being a freelance writer, which I've been for almost 30 years now, that are a struggle. You know, uncertain income, uncertainty of all sorts. But one of the delightful things about being a free, freelance writer is how one story, one idea can lead to another. And that's what happened in this case. And so in seven or, when was it, seven or eight years ago, I was working on my last book, doing research, a book called The Last Empty Places, in which I profiled four really unpopulated areas of the country. And of course, one of them, of those unpopulated areas of the country, had to be Eastern Oregon, as I'm sure some of you can <laughs> guess. And, I was driving in the course of doing my research one night in late May, one evening, down a very long, long, lonely, empty highway in eastern Oregon, and it was getting dark, and I was starting to think I'm going to have to sleep by the side of the road. And I finally came to a little town that had a motel, and I spent the night there with some gratitude for having this town appear out of nowhere. And the next morning, I said, now, how did a town get the name of John Day? <laughs> so, I know you've all heard of the town of John Day and the John Day River and the John Day Dam. There are many things in Oregon named John Day. But I'm not sure everybody knows how John Day, all those John Days got their name John Day. So, I did a little research in John Day and, <laughs> and in a nearby historical society. And it turned out John Day was one of these original Astorians who was part of this huge overland expedition sent by John Jacob Astor from New York in 1810 to found the first American colony on the West Coast and what Astor hoped would be a trans-global, trans-Pacific trade empire. Well, John Day, I didn't know the bigger story at that part, point, I just knew that John Day was this guy who had been, um, I'm trying to think where his trauma started, but it started early. He was a 40-year-old Kentucky hunter, and he ended up being 
um, nearly starving to death, poisoning himself with death camas because he thought they were the edible type of camas root, um, uh, survived by shooting a wolf and eating its skin, was helped by a number of Indians along the way, was left behind by his main party, wandered a winter trying to find the tracks of the main party, lost them, found um, a band of Indians who he thought would help him, um, who ended up stripping him of all his clothes and sending him out into the wilderness with nothing. And after that, John Day was just about done with the wilderness. And he, he, was, he was actually quite traumatized. Uh, it, and it turned out that he, he eventually, he had to go back the same way he came eventually. And it, he pretty clearly had a, what, what it looks to me very much like the symptoms of PTSD. And he, he tried to, he actually tried to kill himself. He tried to shoot himself and he, he didn't succeed. He survived, but he was sent back. And so I read this story of John Day and I thought, wow, that is one incredible story for this town, you know, to have a town named after that. And the more I looked into John Day's story, the more I realized his was just one little tiny part of this huge undertaking that John Jacob Astor had sent to the Pacific Coast. So that's what got me intrigued by it. And the more I, I looked into it, the more it started to look like, wow, this is a story that should be told in a book. And I'm, I'm an adventure writer, I write exploration history. Um, these are the stories I love. And so I, I took it on as a book project. Um, and fortunately I found a very willing publisher with Echo and Harper Collins. Um, so in the introduction, you heard a little bit about what, what the expedition was. There were two, John, John Jacob Astor had a vision of a, a global trade empire on the Pacific Rim. This was right after Lewis and Clark, five years after Lewis and Clark were out here. And Thomas Jefferson had essentially the same vision. And Astor came up with this idea, approached Thomas Jefferson with it. They met in the White House. Thomas Jefferson gave it as enthusiastic endorsement. It was Astor's idea to try to capture essentially all the furs in the western part of the American continent, funnel them through a settlement at the, the mouth of the Columbia River, and sell them to China. And in China, these furs, and especially sea otter furs, would fetch extremely high prices because the Chinese mandarins, for instance, used sea otter furs, which were extremely luxurious, something like a hundred, a hundred, a million um, hairs per square inch. I think the finest, most densely um, coat in the, of any mammal in the world. The Chinese mandarins would pay incredible prices for these furs. So Astor, he was not the first ship here on the West Coast, but he was one of the earlier ones. And he came up with this idea of sending trade goods from New York around Cape Horn by ship to the mouth of the Columbia, trading them to the, the coastal Indians here for furs, um, trading things like knives and beads and pots, um, and then taking those furs to China, trading them to the Chinese for you know, incredible markups at both places, um, taking Chinese luxury goods such as silks, teas, um, porcelain back around the world, back to London and New York. So his idea was to have this, essentially a, a, sh a fleet of ships circling the globe continuously and trading goods all along the way, each at an incredible markup. And Thomas Jefferson had a vision of, he was hoping that Astor's settlement on the West Coast would be the first seeds of an American or, or a democracy. He wasn't even saying it was an American democracy. He, he thought it would be the first seeds of a democracy on the West Coast, Jefferson did, and, he, and, and a, something like a sister democracy to the United States, and that from the West Coast, democracy would, democracy would spread to the East, um, and the two would join in the, in the middle and make the whole continent a democracy. So that's the, the background. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read a little bit about, a little snippet from four different characters. And that's part of what attracted me to the story, was that there are some really distinctly different leaders. 